Mr. Blitzer, uh, for the break, we were talking about those last two phone calls. The two names of staff that worked in your office that were referenced in those calls was Keeney and Ramey. Is that correct? Yes. Now, who was Mark Keeney? He was the chief assistant. All right. And how long had you known him? Several years. And was he a confidant or just second in command of the office? No, I we were friends. All right. And when you weren't there, he would run the office? In theory. All right. And he did not go to BLET. That was Kyle Ambrose. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And have you seen his statement to the SBI? No. All right. Then I'll ask you, uh, around September 29th of 2016, do you remember having a conversation with him about Spencer Morrow? September of 16? September 29th of 2016. I have no idea. In fact, were you aware during September and October 2016 at the frequency of your office calling the SBI? No. Okay. All right, before I ask the question, who is Spencer Morrow then? He was an assistant DA. Okay. And what was his job? He was an assistant DA. Okay. Was he assigned to any particular court? Uh, I think he was doing district court and juvenile court. All right. And did you ever talk to him about the SBI investigation? Did not. All right. And September 29th, would you say that you would have been aware of the SBI investigation? Yes. After you became aware, did you specifically talk with Mr. Keeney about the SBI investigation. Oh, I'm sure we did. <clears throat> All right. You were aware that Keeney was one of the people that took a course for Cindy? Or was that Spencer Mara? Keeney didn't do anything. Okay. So Spencer Morrow took a course? Spencer Morrow, I think, assisted with some sort of placement exam or something all right a placement exam for cindy yes Do you know <clears throat> at what time frame that would have been there's a statement september 2016 for reference so do you I believe it, it was been way before then And do you remember September 29th or in that time frame talking with Keeney about Spencer Mara taking a course for your wife? In what context? Okay, well, <clears throat> did you tell Keeney that he did, that you did not care how it was done, Spencer just needs to keep his effing mouth shut? No. All right. Keep his mouth shut about what? Well, do you remember saying that to Keeney? Uh, not without context, no. Okay. Well, did you tell him to keep his mouth shut about him taking courses for Cindy? There wasn't a secret, so I wouldn't think I would have said that. Did Keeney see some of the textbooks? Uh, which he believed you were using? I'm sure he did. It wasn't a secret. Okay. So you cannot recall any reason you would have told Keeney that Spencer needed to keep his effing mouth shut. Is that right? No. And did Keeney ever say to you that he would see Thank what he you. could do? Sustained. All right. In any context, in September of 2016, do you think you directed Keeney to tell Spencer Morrow to keep his mouth shut? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Why would I do that after I had my lawyer go there and tell everybody they could meet with Agent Whitley at their own free will? Do you know why Keeney would say you did? Uh, probably Action. because... Uh, sustain. Well, at this point, he's a... 
a friend, isn't he? Yes. You know what? Governor, may I attempt to refresh the witness's recollection? Uh, yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Sorry, Madam Clerk. Is my next in order eight? six and seven and take a moment to read the context of the Keeney statement that I was just asking you about. of this conversation all right and if you will also read to yourself page seven I did and all the things that Keeney said about that meeting you have no recollection of is that I right do not. all right I approach the witness yes sir From reviewing at least Keeney's version, there was a meeting between you and Mr. Keeney, isn't that right? No. And so you know any reason why Mr. Keeney would lie about all this? Yes. Okay, why? Well, I know he had issues with the bar and his trust account. Uh, it, in, in my experience, as I'm sure in yours, it doesn't take much motivation when the SBI comes knocking to start saying what needs to be said. I mean, Mr. Keeney retained counsel. You probably should ask him why he retained counsel. So beyond this, did you ever direct any of the people in your office to keep their mouth shut? I never had any of that conversation with anybody in my office. All right. So you can test Mr. Keeney's statement, is that right? I did not have that conversation with Mr. Keeney. And then the context of that question was, that's a statement from September of 2016, is that right? Correct. But when I asked you about the call January, and you said that I threw out Keeney's name to you, you said that troubled me greatly because he was my right hand, right? Yes. So in January, when the name was mentioned to you, you felt like you had a good friend in Mr. Keeney, but as of September 2016, He's saying you're telling these people. Objection. I won't say what he said. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. Go ahead. Did you feel like you were close to Mr. Keeney in September of 2016? I did. So the specifics of this event surprised you, as he has recalled them? Of course. Okay. Now, that was Keeney. At some point, 
Did you change your opinion of Keeney? I mean, you regarded him as a friend during 2016 and then during the phone call, and then I've just showed you a statement. Had something happened to your relationship at all? Other than me resigning, no. Okay. So what you have said is what may be the motivation of this statement to the SBI is he's had bar trust account SBI issues. Bar trust account tax issues. I know he retained counsel. Um, you'll have to ask him. All right. So after you resigned, did you ever see Mr. Keeney again? No, sir. Okay. Have never talked to him about this SBI investigation? After my resignation? Yes. No. And before your resignation, did you? Oh, we would just talk about the office when I was in BLET, and he would just say, well, I think uh, some, you know, this one is going to meet with Agent Whitley today. I think this one's going to meet with Agent Whitley. Um, he would give me his take on what information he got if they would speak to him. If they did, they did. If they didn't, they didn't. So there was nothing about the specifics of the investigation? Not that he related to me. And you didn't discuss with him about concerns about the online courses or any other things going on in the office? I'm telling you, the online courses were not a secret. I, I sat there in my office with the door open. Uh, th they used to laugh because they said the psychology class that I was helping Cindy with calmed the tenor down. I mean, you know, if it was a secret, I'd have shut my door. All right, in the second phone call, the second name is Jason Ramey. Is that right? I don't think you used the name. I think you said it was the other big, heavy set blonde guy. All right, and then you said Ramey. Is That's that right? That's the only other heavy set blonde guy. So tell the jury, um, how do you know Mr. Jason Ramey? He was an assistant DA from the previous administration that I kept on. All right. So Jason Ramey would have been an assistant DA under Phil Berger Jr., is that right? Yes. And he would have worked with Melanie Bridge, your previous political opponent, is that right? They were in the same office at the same time. I don't know if they worked together. And then you took office January 1st, 2015, and what was Jason Ramey's role as an ADA in the office? He was an ADA. Okay. Was he Prosecuted assigned? Prosecuted cases. No, it was, we, we didn't have specific cases, so to speak, or teams. So you didn't have district court ADAs and superior court well, ADAs? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, somewhere early on in my term, he had, we had started moving him up into superior court with some DWI jury trials. All right. So do you know how long he had worked for Phil Berger Jr. before you came home? Maybe a couple of years, maybe a little bit less. All right. <clears throat> and then Melinda Richardson, your AA, also worked with the previous administration. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So did you have any communication with or talk to Jason Ramey during 2015 about anything other than DA work? Uh, I know he, <clears throat> excuse me, had a very young son who had a heart issue so he needed a lot of time to go see the specialist and I told him you know we talked about that and that he didn't have to he needed you know I told him he could take the time he needed then his mother passed and I you know let him know that whatever time he needed he he had <clears throat> but it was just you know office stuff okay you never uh, perceived there was any problem with Mr. Ramey during 2015 between you and him no as a matter of fact uh Prior to Mr. Berger leaving, he gave the entire staff raises except for Ramey, uh, who was married with, I think, two or three children when I took office, and, and uh, <clears throat> his wife wasn't working. So I first thing I did was immediately bumped him up, and uh, I think I actually gave him the most praises while I was there over anybody. All right. So the answer to your question, no, I didn't perceive any problems. All right. When, to the best of your recollection, these online courses started at the office, was Jason Ramey near that? 
I mean, is it, was it, you said everybody knew it was out in the open. Is that right? Well, I mean, his office was kind of across from Kyle Ambrose. So, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm sure he knew they were helping her. So from your perspective, everybody in the office knew that an ADA and a VWLA were doing a course or assisting your wife in a course online. I don't know if everybody knew, but yes. Okay. And Jason Ramey, having worked with Ms. Richardson before your AA, they had a close relationship, didn't they? I have no idea. Did he ever complain to you about things that were going on in the office? He did not. Okay. I know he was I applied for, he applied for the county attorney position at one point because it just paid considerably more. And when did you learn that Mr. Ramey was the first person to file a complaint with the SBI? Uh, quite a while after. I don't remember the exact date. I think it was when I met with Tom Ford. So it would have been towards the end of last year, I think. So even after the May statement, that you gave to the SBI, right? You did not know Jason Ramey was the complainant initially. No. And when you met with Tom Ford, you he didn't share with you the statements of the employees. No. Okay. And he also didn't share with you the allegations that Mr. Ramey made, did he? No. Okay. Now to Mr. Morrow. Uh, you've described him in what position? Assistant DA. All right. Do you remember talking to Spencer Morrow in October? Of what year? I'm sorry, October of 2016. I do not. All I right. I mean, other than maybe office, I was still in BLET at that time, so very limited at the office. All right. Any time in October, you remember having an interaction with Spencer Morrow? I know we had an email exchange about uh, he had thrown away an original citation. There was, for some reason, I have that. I recall that and was all worried about it. And I just remember that, but I don't remember any specific. Uh, someone had told me that he was looking to leave. I think I remember that, but I don't remember any major conversations with him. Do you recall Mr. Keeney ever telling you that he thought still sustained? After talking with Mr. Keeney uh, at any time during September, October of 2016, did you get the impression that you should be concerned that Spencer Morrow was going to tell the SBI about being asked to take these classes online? In September, their investigation was there, September 16th. The investigation was already going. Yes. So did you have a conversation with Mr. Keeney about concerns about Spencer Morrow talking to the SBI? You just asked me about Mr. Keeney. I told you I don't know. And you never talked with Spencer Morrow about it. Is that right? Not that I recall, no. Was Cal Ambrose with you from probation and parole? What do you mean? Did, did I hire him? Did he work with probation and parole before? He resigned in lieu of being fired from probation and parole. All right. So Cal Ambrose, the one who had gone to BLET with you, isn't it true, had a history of falsifying his work hours when he was with probation and parole? Yes. And then you hired him right yes and then he is the one that took one of the courses for your wife right helped and then the one that went with you to BLET right yes and worked the 40-hour non-standard hours that was approved by the conference of DAs correct where he could do it at night or weekends after BLET correct all right so to the civil case You've met with the SBI and given a statement. My question before the break was, at what point 
do your attorneys get linked up with the plaintiff's attorneys in the civil case? I don't know when they linked up. I could tell you that uh, I met with two of the civil attorneys in uh, very early, early to mid June of 2017. Okay. And eventually, you did an affidavit covering the statement of the same things that you had given the SBI. Is that right? Well, I didn't give Agent Whitley an affidavit, uh, but other than their own motivation and the direction of the interview, yes, I had gave a an affidavit to the civil attorneys. <laughs> well, actually, I'm sorry. I gave them a statement. They prepared the affidavit. Isn't it true that after the plea deal and you did the affidavit, the affidavit contained additional items that you had not told the SBI? Well, of course. Okay. Of course. All right. So you were a party to the civil lawsuit initially, is that right? Yes. It was filed in February of 2017. I thought it was March, February, maybe right here. Okay. So it would be natural for your attorneys to at least file some type of extension or answer to the pleadings, is that right? You'll have to ask them what they filed. Well, if you would tell the jury, what attorneys did you use in defense of the civil case? Same ones. Same ones. Same firm. So that would include Mr. Grace, is that right? Yes. The same Mr. Grace has been involved since June of 2016 with you, is that right? Yes, his firm, I don't believe Mr. Grace himself did the civil work. Okay. So he gets the civil complaint, or his firm, and they start defending this around February of 2017? I, I don't know. I don't think they even filed an extension. I mean, they were in communication with the plaintiff's attorneys. Whether anything was filed, I don't know. So isn't it true that before you've talked to the SBI in May, <clears throat> and you, before you're charged with anything, you're a part of this civil lawsuit with regards to Debbie Halbrook, and your criminal attorneys are also the same lawyers that your civil lawyers and then they are in contact with Debbie Hallbrook's lawyers, right? Yes. And as you said, isn't it true that you and Cindy never had to file any type of answer, did you? Because they were in communication with the plaintiff's lawyers. Yes, but that's very common. Okay. So would you agree for the jury that before the SBI interview, your attorneys were in communication with the plaintiff's attorneys in the civil case. Oh, I'm sure they were. <clears throat> During that time, up till the May 5th SBI interview, not asking you to reveal attorney-client privilege, but were you asked in any way to make a statement of events over this year and a half period? To who? <clears throat> to anybody. Yes. To who? To the civil lawyers. And that was even before the SBI interview, right? Oh, no, 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 no. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So before you met with the SBI, did you ever write down a statement of the sequence of events of the previous oh, year and a half? I gave my lawyer notes. Okay. And then your lawyers negotiated with civil lawyers, and you did not have to file an extension or an answer. Is that right? That's my understanding. Okay. So... When you went into the SBI interview, you knew that your lawyers were already negotiating with the civil lawyers to get you and Cindy out of that civil suit, didn't you? I know they were negotiating with the civil lawyers. What, what their, I mean, I'm sure any lawyer was going to try to get us out, but like I told you before, that, that really was the least of my problems, the civil suit. So after you give your statement to the SBI, when is it that you're asked to sit down with the plaintiff's lawyers in the civil suit to give a statement? I told you early June of 2017. Okay. June of 2017. And, Madam Clerk, could I get state's exhibits? May I approach the clerk now? Yes. Oh, 
And Mr. Blitzer, I'm referencing the State's Exhibit 3, the transcript of plea in the criminal case. Yes, sir. It's dated July 17th, 2017. Is that right? Yes, sir. So you entered the criminal plea on July 17th, 2017, right? Yes, sir. And you had sat down with the civil lawyers on behalf of Debbie Hallbrook in June of 2017, approximately a month before the criminal plea. Yes, sir. So do you know where in the sequence of time that it became a condition of your plea to participate in, let me read it exactly. Defendant agrees to fully cooperate with the pending investigation and prosecution arising out of this matter, any investigation by the North Carolina State Bar into this matter, and with the civil court processes in this matter of Hallbrook versus Bradshaw et al. Do you know when that provision was put in your deal? After I met with the civil lawyers. Okay. So you sit down with the civil lawyers, June of 2017, give them a statement, but it's not an affidavit at that point. You're just giving them a statement, right? Yes, sir. And then between then and the plea on July 17th, this cooperation with the civil matter becomes part of your plea deal. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And it's not till after that, that this formal affidavit um, was signed. Is that right? I don't remember the date it was signed. Okay. Am I at 10, Your Honor? She, she's actually more accurate than okay. I on that. Thank you. May I approach with Yes. And he was marked as defense exhibit 10. You recognize that? It looks like the affidavit I signed. You could flip to the last page. Is that your signature? It is. All right. Do you see the date that that is signed? August 17th, 2017. So to put it in context, the meeting with the civil lawyers is June of 2017. Right. Criminal plea with the condition to cooperate in the civil case, July 17th of 17. Right. And then you sign the affidavit August 17, 2017. Correct. Now, with regards to the development of this affidavit, when you sat down with the SBI, you're interviewed and you give them answers and they type that up. Is that right? I guess. I don't know who typed it. Okay. When you sat down with the civil lawyers in June, was it the same way? Yeah, I think what somebody may have been typing as we were talking. All right. Yeah. And then my question is, how did this particular document, Defendant's Exhibit 10, do you know how it was created or edited or reviewed between June of 2017 and when you signed it in August? I don't know who typed it. Okay. Did you look at your statement from June? What do you mean? All right. The statement that you gave in June, you said you think somebody was typing. Did you see oh, anything no, on no. June? You mean the, the notes they left with that yes. day? Yes. No, sir. So I have reviewed some discovery that indicates they were working on this affidavit. I want to ask you about that. Were you aware of any revisions or additions that were made between June and August of 2017? I know that I saw one copy of the affidavit and there were just some minor corrections with typos like candidly like you and I have been making it's 2016 but 2017 appears 
Uh, but those are the only revisions that I saw and I only saw them once. All right, if you could turn to page six. Okay. Now, you recount this first phone call again in the affidavit on page six, is that correct? The January 2017 call, yes. Um, can you look first at January 13th? It's item 20. Page 20, page mm -hmm. 6. Right. Yes. Now, is it true that you previously explained that you didn't include the firing of Debbie Holbrook because she was cooperating with the SBI to the SBI because the SBI was doing the interview? Is that what you said? It just wasn't elicited. I mean, it's in the notes that I gave to my lawyer, which was before any interview. Uh, I told you earlier, you'll have to ask Agent Whitley. I don't know why I would not have told them that. That was the answer then. In the SBI statement, you didn't say Debbie Halbert was fired because of cooperation with the SBI because it wasn't asked. Essentially. Okay. And in the civil affidavit, though, for a lawsuit being filed by Debbie Holbrook, it was stated in here, right? Well, the civil lawyers were asking a completely different line of questions. Right. And with regards to what is in the affidavit, you recount this. Well, if there's no objection, can you just read paragraph 20? There's no objection. I, I don't necessarily object to, at this time, but I don't want to waive any future objections to reading from other documents, if that makes sense, Your Honor. Go ahead, Mr. Bradshaw. All right, so in the civil affidavit signed on August 17th, 2017, if you would read for the jury what you put in the civil affidavit, paragraph 20. Approximately two days after Mr. Bratcher fired, that should be Miss Hallbrook, uh, on January 13th, 2017, Mr. Bratcher called me. Mr. Bratcher asked, quote, do you not agree that as elected DAs, we have the right to fire our employees if they are not loyal? I responded, we can fire them for any reason other than race, national origin, etc. Abruptly and awkwardly, Mr. Brasher then immediately shifted our discussion to the use of a digital discovery program in my office, indicating that the Caswell County Sheriff refused to use a similar system. Mr. Brasher then said, quote, I have an employee whose husband is with the Sheriff's office and she won't talk him into doing digital discovery. The Sheriff is saying that bringing us paper is complying with the statute. I expressed dismay that Mr. Bradshaw would put a member of his support staff up to the task of discussing this matter with the sheriff rather than having those discussions with the sheriff himself. Specifically, I told Mr. Bradshaw, Wallace, if you want the discovery process I use in 17A, then I don't know why you aren't talking with the sheriff himself. I didn't go speak with Melinda, my administrative assistant, about talking with her husband, a deputy sheriff, to go speak with the sheriff. When I asked Mr. Bratcher whether his employee was the wife of the sheriff himself, Mr. Bratcher replied, no, it's the captain's wife. He then immediately shifted the conversation again, stating, but don't you agree that we have the right to absolute loyalty and the right to fire anyone who isn't loyal? That's the end of that paragraph. Okay. Do you recall how different that is from your SBI statement? I haven't read my SBI statement. Okay. And looking at paragraph 21st, 21, do you object to 21? No, Your Honor. I ask that you read paragraph 21. At that point, it was obvious to me that Mr. Bratcher was irate. It was also obvious to me from Mr. Bratcher's awkward and abrupt shifting of the conversation from firing disloyal employees then to the sheriff's use of digital discovery, then back to firing disloyal employees that Mr. Bratcher was attempting to build an alibi 
or some defense for firing one of his employees who he felt was disloyal for speaking to the SBI. I now believe that Mr. Bratcher was trying to set me up as an alibi witness by making these statements to me so that if the terminated employee filed a lawsuit, he could call me to testify. That's the end of that paragraph. So with regards to the statement attempting to build an alibi or defense for firing one of his employees who he felt was disloyal for speaking to the SBI, <clears throat> you did not say that to the SBI, did you? If it's not in there, no, sir. In fact, there's a lot of the last two paragraphs that aren't in the SBI report. Is that, isn't that true? I, I told you I have not reviewed the SBI. Well, statement. isn't it true you didn't tell the SBI I expressed dismay that Mr. Bratcher would put a member of his support staff to the task of discussing this matter with the sheriff, did you? If I didn't, then I didn't. All right. So throughout this affidavit signed for the civil case, did they write down your story word for word? Or did they interview you and then type this up artfully? Uh, they interviewed me. They were writing and typing as I spoke. I cannot tell you if it was a verbatim. I can't tell you if they recorded it. I don't know how fast or how well the person typing that I seem to recall typing typed. So I don't know if this typed version reflects the notes or what I told them. All right, now if you'll turn to paragraph 11 in the civil affidavit. Okay. Isn't it true that for the civil affidavit that you said, in the summer of 2016, I learned that the State Bureau of Investigation was investigating my office as well as Mr. Bradshaw's office? Yes. So the summer of 2016. And do you know when that was? That's when Mr. Henderson came to see me to college. All right, can you narrow it down more than the summer of 2016? Late August, early September. And anywhere in the affidavit or the SBI statement, did you ever disclose that you had heard there was an SBI investigation in December of 2015? No. Now to paragraph four. Okay. In paragraph four, isn't it true that you said that I knew Mr. Bratcher for some years from a murder case? Is that right? I knew Mr. Bratcher from some years ago. Okay. And the last sentence, well, second to last sentence, isn't it true you said before I took office, I met with Mr. Bratcher and told him that I could not afford to leave the private sector and enter public service if my wife could not work? Do you remember saying that in the affidavit? I'm looking at it, yes. And isn't it true that this morning when I asked you about approaching me about hiring my wife, that it wasn't whether it was legal or not, it was when to see how it worked. Everything work okay at home? Is that right? Well, sure. But the affidavit wasn't in the context of where Cindy is at in school, uh, how much she had left to do. It doesn't discuss any of that. But it, it isn't true that you approached me and said you could not afford to leave the private sector, is it? It is true. That, that, that's why Pam Bradshaw left your practice in private practice and came to work for, with you. Well, maybe not understand my question. Do you see the statement here, before I took office, I met with Mr. Bradshaw? I do. And told him that I could not afford to leave the private sector and enter public service if my wife could not work. Is that right? Yes. When is the first time you said that? That was when we met in 13. So this is the Caswell Courthouse meeting? Yes. That you relayed to the jury this morning, is that right? Yes. And that was the question that I asked you, Mr. Latour asked you yesterday about coming to see if you could legally hire your wife. Remember that? Right. And then when I cross-examined you on it, 
you said, oh yeah, it was out in the open. I didn't need to know if it was legal or not. I just wanted to see how it worked. Is that right? Well, I think there was more to my response than that. Was it, I'm not running because I can't afford to run unless I can absolutely hire my wife? You didn't say that, did you? No, because my wife was going to be in nursing school before I got sworn in, but if she didn't or couldn't, then we had a backup plan in theory. So the plan was that she would get out of nursing school and not even come to the office, right? That right. But then during the campaign, she dropped out. Correct. And then you added in the civil affidavit that I purportedly said, oh, it's Where no problem. Where, Where I'm sorry, last sentence of paragraph four. Okay. Isn't it true you wrote, Mr. Bradshaw responded, it's no problem. Pam works for me and she comes and goes as she pleases. We're the boss. Yes. And you contend under oath in this affidavit that I said that to you in 2013. What you said to me in 2013 is you discussed the family first policy that Pam comes and goes as she pleases, that your other employees come and go as they please. We're the boss referring to we are the hiring authority, the sole hire and fire authority. So, yes, you did say that. Well, let me follow up on that. So you contend that I said that all my employees came and went as they pleased. Is that right? You had a family first policy that if children were sick, spouse was sick, someone needed to run for the family, then they had the right to do that. You were okay with that. Okay. Isn't it true? That's different than everybody comes and goes as they please. If there's a kid's first policy and you have a child issue, our team works to support each other on well, that. Right? I think that's somewhat semantics, but you could say that, sure. Okay. Well, to clear it up then, would it be fair to say that I told you about our kids first policy, not that everybody comes and goes as they please? Well, I took it to mean as though everybody comes and goes as they pleases. Whether you did it for morale or, or what you're now calling a kids first policy, like I said, I think it's semantics. And so, in the next paragraph, shortly after Cindy was hired, we got the policy. You see right. that? Yes. All right. And then also in paragraph six, you allege that the decision for switching jobs happened at a pizza place. Is that right? Uh... No, I'm not so sure it reads that way. All right, well, let's read it. Isn't it true that you said, soon thereafter, Cindy and I met with Mr. Bratcher and Ms. Bratcher at Elizabeth's Pizza in Wentworth. Isn't it true that you said, we decided that Ms. Bratcher and Cindy would switch jobs? Yes. So, okay, so that Cindy could work for Mr. Bratcher in Prosecutorial District 9A, and Ms. Bratcher could work for me in Prosecutorial District 17A. Does it say that? Yes. And does it? also state the salaries it does okay so this affidavit under oath indicates that this meeting between the four of us is where the switch jobs was decided but isn't it true based on the documents you've seen today this is not true well no because you showed me an email from margaret wiggins telling me that cindy couldn't work for me dated uh January 8th and 12th, and then you referenced other emails that I told you I never saw that you haven't let me look at or left here. But I also told you even if the transfer of the switch occurred before phone or on the phone, that the, the dynamics of how this was going to work is what took place at Elizabeth's Pizza. If everything was in place before, there'd be no reason to meet at Elizabeth's Pizza. So the so, meeting at Elizabeth's Pizza was to, hey, here's the plan, here's some preliminary emails, <clears throat> AOC's good with the transfer, let's meet and hash out the, the, the finite details. Otherwise, why were we meeting? To have pizza? So is that something you really remember now, or is that kind of an explanation of why this paragraph doesn't fit? The paragraph does fit, and now that we've been talking about it for three days, a little bit more detail comes back. And now that you're letting me look at what I wrote, or they wrote. All right.
right. You see paragraph seven? I sure do. Your Honor, if we're going to go through and read every paragraph in the affidavit, then I would object and would just ask that he introduce the affidavit if he wants to publish the affidavit to the jury. They can read it and he can limit his questioning to the affidavit. But if we're going to go through and answer, I think there are 30 or more of these paragraphs in the affidavit. It's going to take us for judicial efficiency, it's more appropriate to introduce it, have them read it, or do it something like that. But if we're going to do it this way, then I do object to this. All right. Uh, why don't we recess for the afternoon? We'll talk about uh, uh, matters outside the presence of the jury, and we'll resume tomorrow morning at 930 with the jury. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please recall the instructions. I've given you don't talk about this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Don't form or express opinions about the outcome, no media or independent investigation in these matters. And no conversations with parties, witnesses, or lawyers. Leave your notepads in your chairs. Thank you very much for your service, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 930 in the deliberation room. Mr. Bradshaw? Uh, yes, I can certainly understand why the prosecutor stood up and made the objection, but I contend it should be overruled. This is cross-examination, and I believe I'm afforded the right to ask him about each paragraph he's put under a sworn affidavit and its presentation alongside of the SBI statement as redacted should be within the discretion of the defense when to present to the jury. Well, Rule 106 does say that when a writing or a recorded statement is introduced by a party, adverse party may require him at that time to introduce any other part of such writing or recorded statement that ought in fairness to be considered contemporaneously. So you've been given latitude to read par paragraphs into evidence from a statement, and a document that's not been introduced into evidence. I think the prosecutor is saying that in that if you're going to be permitted to read certain statements, then the jury ought to be able to see the entire document in context. So I think that's what we're talking about. Yes, Your Honor. The timing is the issue. I mean, the I am the adverse party. The state's witness is the one that did the affidavit. It is the state who is asking that that be produced during the course of my cross-examination, which I contend that I could even do this cross-examination without him having the document, but, but I thought to help move things along, it would be helpful to put it in his hands. Right, right. and that, I think that's what Rule 106, it, it does speak to the timing. It says contemporaneously. So the notion is, is that when you are referring to a document and, and excerpting materials from a document, the other side can say, yeah, we think the entire document ought to be read contemporaneously and that's how what i understand the objection so yes, do you sir. have a do you have a opposition to the jury having the entire document in front of them i don't eventually but i i would like to be heard just briefly if and i certainly respect any ruling you make but i contend that for example a defendant who reserves the right not to put on evidence should have the right to cross-examine an affidavit written by a state's witness without being required to introduce that as evidence. So I, I, uh, I, that rule I don't believe would compel me to do this, but you can. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> well, um, and, and you know that at times reading a document into evidence, even though it's not formally introduced, does constitute quote, the introduction of evidence for the purposes of the defense uh, last argument. So that's a separate issue. But the question simply is, is if you're going to read from a document, the state is saying they ought to have the document in front of them. Yes, Your Honor. If, um, if I can have some additional time, I will uh, attempt to make copies to do that. Uh, my intent was to try and do that contemporaneously with the SBI statement, but that requires some redaction and some discussions with the state. So, uh, I, and it, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it was the state was not objecting to you know the first three or four excerpts that you read. I think it's 
only come about now that you're on the fifth or sixth excerpt. So Yes, sir. And I had not intended to read every paragraph. I skipped the preliminary stuff. I plan to only address the issues that are in conflict. But again, I'll proceed however okay. you direct. Mr. Latour. I understand Mr. Bradshaw's point, and I think Your Honor's reading my objection appropriately. I, I was trying to give some latitude. It just seems like we're moving along uh, and addressing more of these issues than we initially intended or thought were going to be, which was the basis for why I did not object in the way that I did. Um, I think introducing an SBI statement is a completely separate issue that I don't know that I would be agreeing to that being entered into in this way since he's already cross-examined him and gone through. Part of my concern um, in him going through piecemeal with the statement is it does lose context if we're only going to talk about certain paragraphs and then we skip four other explaining paragraphs uh, causes a problem. I agree with him that there in general is no objection or it is not objectionable for a defendant to cross-examine a witness on certain issues that they have made in prior statements. I do not agree that uh, that latitude is given to a defendant when they go through and read statements verbatim. Uh, I think there is a way that he could cross-examine him on the statements that he's made that would be different than what he is doing. And so that's the basis for my objections. All right. Well, I'm not going to I think the objection's been stated. I'm going to overrule it for the moment. But I will say that depending on you should come prepared tomorrow with copies of the statement, because if we're going to go much further down this road, then I think and the objection is raised again, I would probably allow it just yes, if rather than and, and both under Rule 106 and Rule 611, which is the court's ability to control the mode and order of interrogation. I think it's going to be pretty inefficient to have you go through excerpts and then the state have to go back and read the context for each of those. And so I think the combination of these two rules together suggests to me that if you're going to read substantial portions of an affidavit, then we ought to have the entire affidavit available to be viewed at one time. Yes, sir. I so will comply with that. I'll just leave it at that. If you choose to to read substantially more of this then then we'll revisit the issue thank you your honor all right very good anything else that we need to take up <coughs> no your honor all right very good thank you we'll be in recess then until 9 30 tomorrow morning thank you sir we of course there's a recess until 9 30 tomorrow morning